My name is Justin, and I am a son of God and an addict, and the host of the RICO 12 speaker meeting. And thanks to my God, the steps, and the fellowship of other addicts, I am living the relatively happy, joyous, and free life that is promised to those living in recovery, and have been very active in the rooms of recovery since September of 2013. Welcome to this special meeting of RICO 12. RICO 12 is an organization with the mission of learning and sharing the similarities of addiction of all kinds and gaining and sharing tools and hope from others who are trudging this road. We are an open meeting for all, no matter your life experiences and background. To learn more about RICO 12, please go to www.rico12.com. That's R-E-C-O-1-2 dot com. RICO 12 is a self-supporting service, and we appreciate your help in keeping us working our 12th step in this manner. I will put the information and links in the show notes of this meeting of the podcast if you wish to contribute to this cause. Now, why, you ask, is this a special meeting? It's because this one was recorded in front of a physical audience, a live physical audience of about 100 people at a conference for the SA Lifeline Foundation that was held on Saturday, September 10th, 2022. I, along with the guest speakers Justin and Aaron B. of Texas, were asked to do a session that looks much like a typical RICO 12 speaker meeting during a breakout session of that conference. It turned out to be a great experience for all of us involved. The sound is a little different than normal, as it was recorded in a large classroom and with a live audience. But the audio quality is good enough to catch the message and the spirit of the meeting. Now, to learn more about SA Lifeline Foundation, please check out the links in the show notes below. Now, you will definitely hear the light reflected by Justin and Aaron, and that light will inspire hope, meaning, worth, and growth in you, as it did in the live audience and in me. The title of this session is Healing Families. It Really Happens. I will now jump into the recording where we are all introduced to the live audience. My name is Andrew, I'm a sex addict, and I'm going to be introducing this section. Um, welcome to, to this breakout session of the, of the conference, and thank you for being here. Hopefully you had an enjoyable lunch and you've enjoyed the conference so far. Um, I know it's, it's been pretty powerful for me, um, so hopefully you're experiencing the same. Um, we're here to, to talk about... Healing Families, that's one of the focuses of the foundation and of SAL 12 Steps. So we've, we've invited Justin B. and Justin B. and his wife Erin to, to talk about that. So I'm going to read a little bit of an introduction um, to these folks. And don't they look great sitting up here? <laughs> I, I'm used to seeing them online um, in meetings and... And now I get to see them in person, and they just look great, I think. So, So, Justin B. introduces himself in meetings as the son of God and a recovering addict to lust. Thanks to his God, his sponsor, the steps and, and fellowship of recovery, and not least of all, his extremely patient and wonderful wife, Heather, who has been working her own recovery, exacerbated greatly by his betrayal for eight years longer than he has, he is sober, one day at a time, since June 19, 2015. At almost five years sober, he had a couple of massive awakenings that revolutionized his recovery. He interviewed a couple of men, both of them not of his faith, who introduced to him the concept that the God of his understanding could be incom incomplete and that it is possible to really, really make and improve his conscious contact with God on a daily basis. Justin now makes a serious avocation, striving to carry the, the message through sponsoring others, taking recovery calls and hosting the RICO 12 speaker meeting podcast. If you have any questions about that, I'm sure he'll be glad to answer those questions. Um, Aaron and Justin have been married for 13 years and currently live in Melissa, Texas with their three children, ages 10, seven, and four. Aaron is a college math professor and tutor. Justin works in international communications for 
uh, internal communication, so, yeah. <laughs> the, the font is really small. So, um, internal communications for Liberty Mutual Insurance. They love food, cooking, moving, movies, working out, and all things Disney. Um, their journey with addiction and betrayal trauma recovery began 11 years ago when two years into their marriage, Justin disclosed for the first time that he had a pornography addiction. They spoke with parents and religious leaders and both started 12-step programs. They had the unique privilege of having Aaron's parents in recovery. Aaron's father is 16 years sober and both her parents have led recovery groups. Over the next eight years, Justin took he and Aaron on a roller coaster of white knuckling sobriety and attic mode. His addiction continued to progress until his rock bottom in 2019, which included an emotional affair and suicidal ideation. Finally, they got help from individual and couple certified sex addiction therapists, started attending SAL, got sponsors, and truly worked their own programs. They are both trudging the road of happy destiny and working their own programs for their individual recovery. And it has been a long and bumpy road, gratefully. It has brought them closer together and through a full therapeutic disclosure, amazing therapists, wonderful sponsors, and fellowship of other addicts and betrayed spouses and God's intervening miracles. Today, they are living more happy, joyous, and free. They love sharing their experience, strength, and hope with others, and are thrilled to be at the conference today. So let's give them a round of applause. Yeah. Take it away. All right, real quick, I'm Justin. Um, and before we get started, if you don't mind, I'd like to start us off with the set aside prayer, or a version of the set aside prayer, so that we can, uh, so I don't get in the way of God in this. God. Please bless, help us to set aside this, uh, this meeting, set aside our understanding of each other, of ourselves, of, of recovery, of betrayal trauma, of, of you. We ask that we can set those aside, that we can gain a new understanding of each of these things, that we won't get in the way, and that our hearts and minds will be open to you. We give this next period of time to you, and do so in my higher power's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. We're all, many of us, I'm not going to say we all, many of us are familiar with the SAL book. Um, we call it in the meeting the blue book, the SAL book, whatever. But there's a line on here that you can't read unless you go to the right angle. Recovering individuals, healing families. Healing families is what we're going to talk about today. And I'm really excited about our guests. Andrew's done a great job introducing them, so I'm not going to go into any more detail. But I love Justin. And Erin's awesome. I've met her a couple times online and now in person, and this is really good online. I don't know if you and over the phone, Zoom, whatever, but really good stuff. Um, they're going to share their story with us, and then we'll be a asking some questions. We're going to run this in a Q&A. So if you have questions, save them up for the end, and we'll take your questions and answers at that point. Justin, Heather, it's yours. Have you ever fallen down the rabbit hole on the internet looking for advice only to end up more confused than when you started? When you have questions, it feels impossible to find on-demand answers that you can trust. On the AnyQuestion app, you can ask the world's greatest experts questions directly about health, nutrition, fitness, hobbies, and more. You get exclusive access to video replies from leading professionals like gold medal winning Olympians and doctors at the top hospitals. Unlock life-changing insights from the people that know it best. Download the AnyQuestion app or go to anyquestion.com forward slash podcast for free access through to the end of the year. Stop searching. Start asking on the AnyQuestion app. There. Sorry. Um, so I'm going to start a watch because it's, one, it's fun to see so many faces from meetings and stuff in person. It's just like, oh, this is awesome. Um, but those of you that have been in meetings with me know that I can run long, and so I'm going to start, <laughs> start a timer to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, first of all, can you hear us okay? Are you picking up the audio good? And here's in the back. Thank you. Can't see you. Thanks, Brent. Okay. Well, that's probably better for everybody if you can't see me. Um, one, thanks for joining us after 
Dr. Skinner's presentation, I told Aaron, it's like, we're just going to dismiss and we're all going to go there. That was incredible. So flattered, one, to be asked to speak, and two, that you'd come. Um, I just wanted to share real quick. So three years ago, I came to this conference. Uh, it was right after our disclosure. We were separated, and we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, but there was a couple that offered their experience, strength, and hope. Their story was very similar to ours, and they were still married. And I was at a really difficult point, and hearing somebody offer that, that strength um, was kind of a game changer for me. So hopefully what something we say can be of benefit to you, um, and, and like Justin said in the prayer, we can put aside any of our own thoughts and, and speak what God wants to say. Also, if you're single, separated, divorced, in the middle of divorce, whatever it might be, um, hope that that doesn't take you out of this message and, and that God can still speak to you. He loves you and is aware of you and your needs, and so hopefully you can hear what he has for you today. And your family still needs healing. Yes. And this is what we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so kind of brief uh, rundown of our story. I was first introduced into pornography when I was 11 years old. Me and three of the friends were hanging out at, at a house and we found a, a magazine that his dad had and uh, we thought, well, this is pretty cool. Let's check it out. I immediately knew that it was wrong, um, but still chose to look and I can still, I mean, those mem images are forever burned in my brain. Um, over the next several years, it was uh, I was kind of immediately hooked, um, repeated exposure through magazines and videos at friends' houses, um, looking for a lust hit anywhere I could get it. And um, anyways, it, it progressed um, when I was in college. It was to the point where I was online chatting in sex chat rooms, uh, masturbation, video chatting. And um, over the years, I had told my parents a couple times, told religious leaders, and the, the message was always the same, right? Like, pray harder, go to the temple, don't go to the temple, wait two weeks to go to the temple, don't take the sacrament this week, take next week. Um, you know, fast more, all those things, and, and it'll go away. And I was told that, um, and I believe that when I got married, it would, it would just go away, right? Because it was just a, a sexual craving, and when I could have a sexy, a healthy sexual relationship, then it just all goes away, right? And we know that that is not the case. Um, unfortunately, I did not tell Aaron about my addiction before we got married. Um, I, I bought into that belief that it would be a non-issue. I'd been sober for four months before we got married, and so I was like, oh, I'm fixed. We're great. We're good to go. Um, and about six months into our marriage, I relapsed. And I thought, okay, this is a fluke, never going to happen again. And it happened again and again and again. And finally, two years into our marriage, I was like, okay, I need to, need to tell her something. So um, disclosed to her one night, totally out of the blue, dropped the bomb and said, hey, I, I struggle with the pornography addiction and, and have been relapsing and uh, gave her not even the full information of, uh, of what was going on. So... So I thought I'd never be happy again. Um, all those feelings Dr. Skinner talked about, like, who are you? What have we built? This, I don't even know you. Those were all the feelings that I felt. Um, I told Justin, well, backing up. So my parents, my father is a sex addict who's been in recovery for a while. My parents had both been in recovery for a while. And um, I told Justin, I didn't know it at the time, but they had told me that I always needed to ask when I was dating, do you have an issue with pornography? And so that was something that I had been taught growing up. Do you guys want us to stand so you can see us? Yeah. Okay, I'll okay. stand. I can stand. <laughs> um, sorry, the camera guy. I hope we're on camera still. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, so they had told me I needed to ask about pornography being an issue because it's just more prevalent now than it used to be. Well, I had a religion teacher who had taught that, um, you know, Christ's atonement makes it like it never happened. And so someone could honestly answer that, no, they didn't have an issue if it's not currently an issue. Okay. So I just bought that because that sounded nicer and cleaner and easier. And so I told Justin about these two different conversation, you know, ways to approach this and said, so do you have anything to say to me, you know, about this? 
And he said, no, I don't. <laughs> Let's go get married. And so I thought all was well. So when he came forward two years in, I was just shattered and heartbroken. And I thought, I don't even know you. He'd been on this pedestal, this perfect guy. So I told him he had to tell our parents. That was the first time I learned about my own father's sexual addiction and their experience. My mom was my first group leader. And it was a really cool experience to learn. When I was in the group, there were all these girls I'd grown up with and their husbands I had grown up with and knew and loved. And it took away some of the shame for me of that this affects the best people that I know and all the best men in my life and my relatives. And this is just something that affects everybody. So that started to help me. And I started doing the, the 12 step in that old program. Yeah. So we told our parents, told our bishop, um, went and got therapy, went through. Therapy. Yeah, he was a dentist by day and a therapist, therapist by night. <laughs> <laughs> For real. He's a really good guy, I'm sure he's a great dentist. <laughs> but, but it wasn't, it wasn't super helpful. He, he told me that I couldn't trust my husband's behavior, but I could trust that he would now be accountable. And so someone who had kept something from me is now magically going to tell me the truth but I clung to that I told that to other people who had just entered I have some regrets um, but I know the truth now that's not how addiction works that's not how behavior changes and so I just started believing whatever Justin told me about his recovery and I would start asking questions because now I knew this was a thing and I was always reassured that he was doing well things were going fine yeah and we started going to, as Aaron mentioned, started going to 12 cent meeting through the LDS Church ARP program. That was the first time I'd ever like, had a concept of a 12 step program. And it did help. Um, about, I was about six months sober and I was fixed. And that's what I always wanted, right? I just wanted to be fixed so that I didn't have to ever worry about this again and it'd be all be gone and life could just go on. And so six months sober, that's the longest I'd gone. I was like, great, I'm fixed. This worked, okay, stop going to meetings. Stop talking about recovery, stop paying attention. And life was good at that point. Work was going well, our relationship was good. And so um, I was sober, and I say it that way because looking back, like I was still getting lust hits whenever I could get them. I just wasn't acting out my normal, acting out behavior. Um, that lasted for a couple of years, and then life got hard again. And work was stressful. We and had kids. We, yeah, we had kids. Um, she just had our second. Um, work was super busy. And I relapsed. And I told myself, well, I can't tell her right now because we've got a little one. And how stressful is that? And it's just going to crush her, so I better keep the secret. So I went through this whole pattern again of acting out uh, frequently and hiding it from her. And she would ask, and, nope, everything's good. Yeah, not an issue anymore. I'm fixed. No, no problems um, until finally um, we were having some meeting with our bishop and I knew that it was going to come to a head and I had to say something and so I told my bishop and then it was like a couple months later I told her again saying hey by the way I've been lying and relapsing again I was so mad I was so mad because this time I knew that he'd been deliberately lying to me I had asked all the right questions I had are you doing this? Have you seen this? How is your emotional state? You know, so I was really pissed because you've been lying to my face this time, not just like I never knew about it. So I was really angry and sad. It's like all the emotions and then anger on top. So we realized now that the first counselor's counsel was bad. So we found a new therapist, had really nice leather couches, very expensive. <laughs> And um, so we thought he was a great therapist. One of the messages, we, we have since learned the value of specialized therapy, which we'll talk about later. Um, one of the messages that I got from this therapist was that I had been, um, because my father had been a sex addict, that I had been seeking for a similar relationship in my own marriage relationship. So it's my fault that I married a sex addict. Like, I chose this which is hilarious and so wrong because I intentionally looked for someone who had different attributes than the ones I didn't like in my dad. So I picked someone who I thought was the opposite. And here I'm getting told by my therapist that I'm living in a self-fulfilling prophecy. So anyway, he didn't do a lot of good for us either. But at the time we thought it was, you know, 
We, you look <laughs> legit. <laughs> so anyway. Uh, and, and he told me, he said, you're always, if you don't do something different, you're always going to go back to porn. And I was like, oh, that makes sense. What should I do different? And I never got that answer. So <laughs> but that is true, but I would never got the answer what else to do. So um, went back to ARP, told parents again, told bishops again, <laughs> went through the cycle. And I'm super intelligent and a really fast learner. So six months later, when I was fixed again, I stopped going to meetings. And, and this time, I'm asking better questions, yeah. more questions. You know, I'm trying to make sure he's working his recovery because right. that's my job, right? I can. Yeah. You know. So <laughs> about a year later, um, we were mo we were living in Georgia at the time. Um, I'm from Utah. I wanted to come back here. I got accepted to the U. Go Utes! I saw someone for sure. Um, <laughs> I'm glad nobody walked out on that one, thank you. <laughs> um, but I uh, came back to do my MBA, and so we, we moved to Utah. Um, I came up a month or two earlier to start work while we were getting everything ready to move. And within weeks of moving out here, I relapsed again. And I really wanted to be in Utah, and I really wanted her to like being in Utah. And so again, I told myself, well, I can't tell her, because then she'll associate relapsing with Utah, and then she'll never want to stay here. <laughs> and it's already stressful, because she's home alone with the kids while I'm at work. So again, obviously not a fast learner. So I hit it again, and went through a um, period of relapse and, and lying. This time it was different, though. I think maybe we mentioned as few as you were walking in as I'm sure addicts in here have experienced, every time I went back to my addiction, I just picked up from where I went off and then went darker and deeper. Um, so this time it got bad quick, um, and I was not in a good, healthy state. I was working full time and doing school full time. Um, we had another child, so she was home alone almost all the time with three little kids. I was at school and working. Um, and just super resentful. I came home. Why is the you know why is the house a mess? Why is the dishes dirty? You know, what have you been doing all day? And she gets home and she's just exhausted. Um, and I'm gone all the time. And I just fed in like all that resentment that I had developed. I used as justification for my addiction. You know, like we're disconnected. She's unavailable. And this time, unfortunately. Um, I, one thing that I love about SAL that I've learned is our addiction is to lust and be lusted after, right? And so I was lusting through pornography, but I, the, I was missing the piece to be lusted after. And so I um, pursued and was involved in an emotional affair with the woman that I worked with. Um, for all intents and purposes, I dated this woman um, short of kissing and having sex. I mean, I, we were totally involved, talked all the time, but outside of work. Um, and I was certain, like, this is, you know, this woman has everything that I want. My wife has nothing that I want. Um, I'm only sticking around for the kids, like, game over. And one night, uh, and this, I feel stupid even saying it, but uh, addicts are stupid. Uh, <laughs> um, I came home one day and it was like, hey, we need to talk about the state of this house and how messy it is and everything you're not doing. And like had this conversation about all my frustrations and how I'm feeling, you know, overworked and blah, blah, blah. And I heard God say to me to just wait and to just listen because it wasn't about the house. And so if I could sit still and keep my mouth shut while he was talking, then I could ask my question what does pornography have to do with this? And I did. And even though the housekeeping was a really offensive conversation. Um, but then I said, okay, this isn't about the house. What does pornography have to do with it? And then he finally opened up about the last year and a half of using. He did not open up about the emotional affair. And over the next year, so then I started finally going to my own therapist, a betrayal trauma specialist, and I felt so validated and it was this whole new world that I am not crazy there's a reason why I feel the way I do and it was really good for me to have my own therapist and so he also saw his own CSAT therapist so like we're starting to see the right kind of therapists but our relationship is still pretty rocky because he's holding on to the secret and I don't know about it 
But I, I am starting to suspect, and I even asked about this woman several times and would bring, up, bring her up. When we started going to, um, Justin eventually said he wanted a divorce in January. He had brought the other stuff up November. So January, he says he wants a divorce. I say, okay, but we ha have to go to couples therapy to try first, like last ditch effort. So we do, and I brought her up in couples therapy, all the gaslighting coming back. And eventually we decide to do a formal therapeutic disclosure, like get it all on the table. Yeah, so to give you an idea, November, she has asks about pornography, and I, I tell her just the pornography piece. January, I say I want a divorce. And then she had said, you know, I want a full therapeutic disclosure. We didn't do the full therapeutic disclosure until the following September. So it was nine months later. And a big part of that was I was dragging my feet like, if we do a full therapeutic disclosure, I have to give up everything. And I wasn't ready to do that. Um, it was probably June-ish, May or June, where I thought, okay, yeah, let's, let's do this. Um, and as it got closer and I started writing my disclosure, I was overcome with shame. And I knew for sure there was no way we were gonna stay married after this. Like, it's not gonna happen, I've done too much, it's, we're not gonna stay married, I can't, it, yeah, I can't do this. But I knew that I had to, um, and so in my distorted thinking, my solution was the only noble choice left is to remove myself from the situation. Um, if I kill myself, we're not gonna be married anyways, so that's irrelevant. So if I kill myself before disclosure, then she doesn't have to hear it, and then she's still gonna, she can move on without having to worry about me uh, getting in the way or having to co-parent or anything. So I felt like that was the, the noble decision. Um, so I had a plan and I had a date, and um, I was kind of white knuckling for a couple of days and felt like, okay, I can either kill myself or I can cope using porn. So I went back to my addiction. I'd been sober for a couple of months and started acting out again. And in a moment of clarity, uh, I can only define as God intervening, I thought I need to talk to somebody. And so I have two best friends. <clears throat> We've been close for Tough. almost 30 years yet. Yeah. <clears throat> Luckily, one's a therapist. Um, so I called them and said, hey guys, this is, this is what's going on. And they didn't know about the affair. They knew about my addiction. And uh, <clears throat> shared with them. I didn't, I didn't even tell my uh, therapist about, uh, about my suicidal ideation. And told him. And um, he's... <clears throat> I did not expect to get this emotional. <clears throat> he said, Justin, you have three choices. It's death, disclosure, or divorce. And he said... <clears throat> Please don't pick the first one, but I'll help you with either or the other two. And he said, but why don't we try disclosure first? <clears throat> and I so I decided, okay, well, we'll maybe work in reverse severity, right? So we'll do disclosure first. If that doesn't work, we'll move to divorce. And then I'm not quite ready to take death off the table, but but I'll table like I'll put it on the back burner for now. Um, so we had our full therapeutic disclosure in September 2019. Um, <clears throat> and it was as bad as I thought it would be. Um, it was worse than I thought it would be. <laughs> and um, hours of reading everything I'd done, lots of crying, and um, we knew that we needed some time that weekend. Um, and then it became a couple, very clear to me that I needed more than yeah. the weekend. So, so then we separated for, uh, ended up being three months. Um, so he wasn't living in the home. Our kids actually never knew. They were young enough that, um, and he was gone enough with work and school that we were able to keep that part of it from them, but they, they knew other things were up. But I had a dream that I was like Iron Man and I could shoot all of my pain. That was like my energy was my pain. And so I shot it at Justin and he died because he couldn't handle all of my pain. <laughs> it's kind of funny, but um, I wanted to like kill him, literally. I made friends stay with me in the car when we were, we didn't have contact for a week or two. 
um, because I wasn't sure I could restrain myself from attacking him because I just wanted to. I hurt so bad. I was so angry. And just revisiting it, like, we're three years away from this, and this still makes me feel this way. It is so, it was the worst thing we've ever done, and it ended up being one of the best things we've ever done. It was the hardest piece of our recovery, and I would do it again every time. Yeah. I would choose it again, and we need to move faster because well, we want to leave time. Um, <laughs> like Dr. Skinner outlined, we did the full therapeutic disclosure. Therapeutic is key there. Please do a therapeutic disclosure. Yeah. Um, and then an impact statement. So she was able to share how she felt about everything that I'd done. And I didn't realize how honest I hadn't been, like they talked about in there. I thought, I'm not lying, I'm, but I wasn't being honest or um, healthily communicating my needs and my emotions. And so personal individual therapy really helped me learn how to do that and, and the whole process. Yeah. And then we did a, a restitution letter. So that all wrapped up December 2019. Um, like I shared briefly at the beginning, a week after disclosure, um, we came to the conference here. I'd been to a couple- You came, I didn't I, come. Yeah, sorry, I came. Um, I'd been to a couple in-person SAL meetings. I'd been to SAA, SAA and ARP, and was kind of trying to find a, a fellowship. And like I said, after coming to this conference and hearing experience, strength, and hope of others, I was like, okay, I'm gonna do SAL. Um, that Tuesday, I went to the, Jeez, I'm not the crier. I'm the crier. <laughs> um, I went to the <clears throat> Tuesday 8 o'clock Zoom meeting. And uh, <clears throat> immediately felt loved and supported. And guys stayed on after and talked to me and called me that week. And I love you guys. <clears throat> And so uh, that kind of started us on our recovery journey. Erin started going to SAL. Well, no, I oh, did not yet. Ahead. Oh, yes. So a month after disclosure, he was in London for work, and I hit my rock bottom. He had, his Marco Polo didn't come through when it was supposed to, and I was so traumatized and so triggered. I just knew he was out of bars with prostate like. I went way to the far end of things he'd never done before, but I was sure he was doing now. So I was, we were in Utah, he was in London. I call him, it's the middle of the night, I get through to the hotel and I'm in my backyard and I'm screaming all the F words and I'm just raging at him for how he missed his check-in and how, like, if I hadn't heard from him, I probably would have filed the next day. Like, I was so angry and that's when I was like, oh, this is unmanageable behavior. <laughs> like, oh right, 12 step, I probably need some help. Because my other support group and therapy and all the things I was doing already still wasn't enough to, for, for me to learn how to cope. And so that's when I was like, oh, 12 step. And he had shared some of his stuff from the SAL conference. So I was like, okay. That weekend I went to a retreat called Heart of a Woman, which has changed my life. Um, it has been, it's my second and third step, and I go every year, twice a year, because it brings me closer to the higher power of my understanding, and it's helped me deconstruct some of the um, incorrect assumptions I had about my higher power and build them back to be correct. So that was that weekend, and then my first SAL meeting was two days later when I got home on a Tuesday, and I've been going three years since. Um, but the program, the, S, the 12 steps have changed our lives as we've both worked them, it's changed how we parent. It's changed how we're teammates. And um, and I just, I thank God for the program. And we continue to come back because we are our best selves when we're in the program and working and sponsoring and, and, and all yeah. the things. Yeah. And likewise, like I said, I started coming to meetings. Phenomenal therapists. Um, we'll shout out the names, but um, if you're in Utah, John Taylor at White Pine Recovery in Kaysville. Dina LaTondra is a couple of therapists at Renew Hope Counseling in Kaysville, and Mindy Lundgreen with um, Addo with in Addo Farmington. In Farmington. Um, just they literally saved our lives. We think they are the reasons why we needed to come to Utah so we could find them, so we could yeah. find actual recovery yeah. for ourselves. And then I went in, uh, I'd been to Warrior Heart once before, but I was in the middle of addict and affair so like I got this much of it doesn't count uh, <laughs> so I went to warrior heart later they're downstairs if you haven't been highly 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 recommend it 
Um, and like Aaron said, like counseling, SAL, Warrior Heart, like that's been huge for us. There's, I, we, I debated, I have a t-shirt um, that I was almost gonna wear. It's, um, it says, All Things New. It's a song by a Christian band named Big Daddy Weave, if you guys know him. Um, love Big Daddy Weave. But um, it talks about taking things that are broken and making something new. And that, <clears throat> ah, that song is dear to my heart because it's, it speaks to me and about who I am as a person, but also about our marriage. Um, I, I don't like to say he's, you know, God saved our marriage or God restored our marriage because it's not the same marriage that we had yeah. before all of this. It's not like, oh, we're back to where we were and it's good. No, it's... That it, was broken. That was broken. It's a totally new marriage and it's better than it's ever been. So like we said in the little title, like Healing Families does, does really happen. And it's bumpy. There's still trauma. There's still triggers. There's still things because we're human. But we can use our tools. We can take a time out. We can call our sponsors. We can surrender. And when we use those tools, then we're able to come out on the other end and be closer for it. Um, I would not choose this path, but I would not change who I've become because of this journey. So I'm still trying to make peace with that, but but I'm grateful. That I'll take another 24. Thanks, and Justin. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Justin and Aaron. Yeah, let's give them a round of applause. For you. you know the imagery that the Aaron Aaron uh, put in my mind when she said she turned into Iron Man and just blew him away with the hate, <laughs> blasted him away, and then just a minute later, I saw her reach down pull out some tissue to set before Justin at that two point. <laughs> that imagery changed to a Care Bear doing the Care Bear stare. <laughs> <laughs> with, with hearts and rainbows coming out with love, you know? And what a miracle that is. I, I just, I just, uh, it, the, the, the visceral and the, the, the imagery there just hit me so hard. Thank you for sharing those, those things with us. We'll be taking some questions. I have a, a question that I'm gonna start out with, but if you have a question, um, just raise your hand at that point and we'll get to you. But the first question that I have for you, and this is for Aaron, what is the rebuilding trust looking like today? You know, I'm sure in it's my experience, over time. my wife still doesn't trust me, you know, seven years later all the time. <laughs> That's a rebuilding process. Mm -hmm. How does that look to you and, and to Justin? It's such a point? great question. I don't know that I'll ever fully trust that he won't take us there again. I do believe him now when he says something because he's built so many Lego blocks of trust over the last three years. It's a really, really slow process. I trust my higher power and I trust my body. So I will never ignore when my body is giving me those red flags again. So when he says something and it's aligned with my body and it's aligned with what I hear from my higher power, then I feel peace that he's being honest or he's, he's whatever. Did you always trust your higher power? Like no, today? no, I didn't. No. What changed? Um, so I, it, for me, what changed was disclosure, finding out the full truth and realizing that those intuitions, those guts, when he'd been lying to me, I was, I had this inner, um, what's the word? Dissonance, uh, inner conflict, mm -hmm. because I was pretty sure that I was feeling this, but he was telling me it wasn't happening. And so this inner dissonance meant that I thought, God wasn't talking to me, and I thought that he wasn't showing up for me. And so finding out the truth made me realize, oh, God was talking to me, and you're the liar, and mm -hmm. you're the one who made me not trust myself, and I will never do that again. Mm -hmm. Love it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, questions for Aaron or Justin from the audience? Yes? I have a question. So Aaron started out saying, um, I thought I'd never be happy again. And I would love to just hear now, since you're obviously, you can see happiness, you know, what is that like for you now? Well, time helps a lot. Um, learning to tend to my emotions, self-care. All, all of the answers are the right, the answers we hear are the answers. It, it takes a lot of work and community and in being intentional. Like I remember after disclosure, I really thought I'd never be happy again. I prayed that God would kill me somehow. So it would be sanctioned by God, but it wouldn't be me <laughs> taking my own life because I couldn't live with the pain. And so I would, and I had my kids still, you know, so we, I would do, the only happiness I could find was dance parties with my kids. So I could do it for five minutes. I could turn on a song and I could find some joy and then I would go back to depression. 
So it, it's time and intention and I don't know, it, that's a really hard question, Jenny. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else have a question for either Justin? Yes. Do you think you would ever feel the need to do another full disclosure? I know that some people, they do like disclosures regularly. Like, is that a thing, I guess? <laughs> we actually had to do two the first time because he kept some of the secrets still. So I had a lot of questions after the first disclosure, things that didn't quite add up for me. I teach math, I'm analytical. So there were some things that didn't add up to me and upon asking those questions, we realized, oh, there are some things that you haven't shared that you should have included in your disclosure. So we did do a second one before we continued in that disclosure process. Right now, I will never put it off the table. Um, I don't feel the need to do one at this point because everything says that I'm getting the truth. And so there's not deceiving behaviors that I need to be made aware of. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And for me, um, right after disclosure, something I didn't anticipate was how freeing it was. It was the first time in my life that I didn't have secrets, ever. And I remember we took a break and we're walking around the building. I was, I was with my therapist. And he said, this is really hard. And he said, you have a choice to never have to do this again. And that was powerful for me. And I, I made a decision that I don't ever want to do this ever again. This is awful. Um, and so I committed to like, kind of like what Dr. Skinner was saying, like rigorous honesty. My therapist called it ridiculous honesty. Like you're being so honest, it's kind of stupid, but like, um, and it was really hard, especially she asked some follow up questions. You know, did you ever do this? Did you ever say this? Did you ever share that? Particularly about the affair. And I really didn't want to answer the questions honestly. And so there were several times where I had to like really push and challenge myself to stay committed to that. Um, but it's been so freeing and for myself personally, like the, the pain that I that it occurs when I have to disclose something that's hard to hear is way better than the pain of holding a lie or getting caught in a lie later on. Um, so I won't do another one. Well, one day at a time, I hope to never have to do another one. Let's say it that way. <laughs> love it, love it. Justin, early on, and I'll get to your question in just a second. Early on, you said uh, you related something that somebody told you. You can either do something different or go back to porn. Or maybe you related that in your own mind. Yeah. What do you do today that's different so you don't go back? Work the steps. That's the answer. That's what he was missing. Um, you will, and I loved what um, Dr. Lemke explained, just the psychology, like the science of the brain and how it works. Um, like our brains are wired to make ourselves feel better. So stress and pain and frustration, all those things, we're wired to do like, and as addicts, we've wired ourselves to turn to our addiction, to feel better. And it's true, if you don't rewire your brain, you're always gonna go back to that. And the missing piece was work the steps. You which, know, which you really wasn't doing. Which I, wa I wasn't doing. I was writing the things in the manual. I never made a call outside of a meeting. I didn't know I was to surrender. I'd never done like a really a fourth step in inventory, looked at my character defects. I'd never really made amends other than saying, I'm sorry, when she was crying, you know, like I hadn't worked the steps. And neither had I, and I'd never let him work his recovery. I'd always told him what it should look like because I have all the answers. <laughs> and if you, <laughs> I felt so validated when his therapist, he'd come home and be like, my therapist said this. And it's like, I could have saved you $150. <laughs> <laughs> come from me and it took rock bottom for us to give each other the space to work our own recoveries instead of me trying to work both if that doesn't work either yeah. love it thank you did you have a question yes yeah, so this was you know healing families so I'm wondering if you have tips for helping new families like your children especially older teens um, without maybe if the behaviors are still ongoing how do you help kids help cope with that just that cycle of dysfunction we don't have older teens so we don't have experience with that what experience we do have with 10 and under has been um, we try to help our children talk about their emotions 
So we try to help them identify them. We have feelings wheels with like funny faces on them, you know, for our kids to try to do that. And we're trying to model better behavior so that they see healthy conflict resolution instead of just yelling behind closed doors, you know, or whatever. Do you have more answers? Yeah, I think um, it's, I can't go back and heal all the wounds that I've caused in my children. Uh, I'm incapable of doing that. Um, God will do that, and I will help pay for their therapy when they're older. <laughs> and, and so they can work those things out. The best thing that I can do now is try to work a living amends for the harms that I've created for my children and showing up in better ways to, to be present, to talk about you know, healthy emotions and talk about addiction recovery and like what is addiction and how do we deal with it and shame and all those things. We try to teach our kids the, the circles models. We do use them. And we teach our kids the healthy model. So we try to teach our children about God and about how to have an authentic relationship with God. And we teach them about self-care and about therapy and about mindfulness. We have a kid with some anxiety issues. And so we're trying to teach them these tools that we're learning too. So we're all kind of learning together. And, and uh, yeah, uh, Stephen, do you have a question? I do. That's such a good question. So when I first told her, I was very much in shame and I'm sorry and everything. And like, we had a good cry and then went to bed. I was like, oh, well, that wasn't as bad as I thought. And I woke up in the middle of the night hearing her sobbing. And that was the first time that I kind of felt some of the pain or understanding of the pain that I caused her. So, um, every disclosure, that kind of repeated itself, and I hated seeing her cry and making her cry. Um, I don't think I really understood until full disclosure and then the impact statement specifically. So that was probably November 2019. Um, and her really laying out how she felt. And then the next process of me doing the restitution letter, my therapist and I did a lot of work of leaning into that and how that really made me feel and really trying to get empathetic. Um, and that was the, probably the most impactful process to me to really understand like, okay, if, if I was in her shoes, if this had happened to me, how would I really feel about it? Um, but even today, like listening to, to Dr. Skinner talk about betrayal trauma and looked over a couple times and Aaron's got tears. <clears throat> it still hurts. Um, um, so I don't know like like Dr. Skinner said I'll never know the pain that she's experienced from betrayal trauma unfortunately uh, or, or fortunately um, it would kill you <laughs> <laughs> it probably will, it probably will. Um, but I think it's a growing process I I, I I'm not so arrogant to say like, oh yeah, I know how she feels. Um, I never will. And I, I think God is continuing to show me a little bit more to help fight for her heart. Thank you so much. So because one of my character defects is that I'm a slave to the clock, I need to see where, how are we time-wise in this? Do we need to wrap this up or do we have a few more minutes? All right, a few more minutes. Yes. Um, I'm wondering how you, if you disclose anything our oldest is 10 we have not yet disclosed to him much about the details what we have disclosed to him is that dad has seen porn in the sense of let's talk about it like when are you gonna see it and how do we handle that when that happens at the time of disclosure I was so out of it I was on the couch most every day and I just kept telling the kids my head hurt which was true but it was happening so much that my kids were like do you need to see a doctor your head is hurting so much and so I was like okay we need to talk about this a little bit more and at the time they were like seven and four and one 
And so I said, mom, I'm seeing a doctor. It's called a therapist and my head hurts and my heart hurts and I will be okay. And it's not your job to make me feel better. I'm taking care of that. I love you. Just know that I'm okay and I'm working on it. And so we will circle back around and tell them more as it's more age appropriate. We do feel like it's important for them to know the truth eventually when that feels more age appropriate and it just doesn't yet. So if you have any tips, let's <laughs> share. <laughs> so so I, I can answer a couple of questions from my perspective on, the, uh, on what you asked about um, they're both about children, about what to do with, with the children. I have teenage and adult children, um, and my wife and I have talked not brutally specifically about things, but have been very specific on the fact that I work recovery, my wife works recovery, and it's for sex addiction. Uh, it involves pornography, it involves all of the things that surround that, and it involves, um, and, and, and we share very pretty openly, not very openly, but pretty openly, the, the, the solution that we are gaining. You know, we share the problem, we share the solution. Um, now, I, I don't speak from a moral high ground on this because my wife and I, our, our, relation, our communication still sucks, but we're working on it, um, and, and we try to improve. But um, it is a, a, a good thing, and I see that it's about time here. Do you have any final words of wisdom before we close out? One day at a time, it works when you work it, so and you're really, worth it. your family's worth it. Yeah. You're killing your family's worth and, it. And I did want to say, I'm sorry, thank God that we are here together today, and it's worked out. We often look at each other and it's like, I don't know how this happened. This is a miracle. Um, if this isn't your story, and it didn't get resolved, and it ended in divorce or separation, that's okay. Um, God loves you, and... He'll take care of you, and I'm sorry, and my heart hurts for you. And um, but there, like Aaron said at the beginning, there's still healing that can and needs to happen. Um, awesome. Let's give it up to for Aaron. And Aaron. Man, wasn't that cool? I so enjoyed doing a meeting in that format and would be open to being invited to do something like this in other recovery centered conferences. If you have questions about this, please send an email to rico12pod at gmail.com. That's R-E-C-O-1-2 P-O-D at gmail.com. Next week, we will continue with pre-recorded interviews and meetings that will go through the end of the month of December, 2022. Next week, we will hear from Sid K, the AA history nerd, as he speaks to us and answers questions about the flying blind period of AA. Now that's the time between 1935 and when the big book was published in 1939. This one is going to be so good. I love learning the history of recovery, and Sid does a great job with it. Now I will pull the recording of the seventh step prayer that I closed out this breakout session with to close us out with in this meeting. I'm going to close us out with the seventh step prayer. Um, because it's one of my favorites. And I'm going to do it in the we, in the we uh, pronoun. Our Creator, we are now willing that you should have all of us, good and bad. We pray that you now remove from us every single defect of character which stands in the way of our usefulness to you and our fellows. Grant us strength as we go out from here to do your bidding. Amen. Amen. Come trudge this happy road with me, everybody. Work it, you are worth it. Like me, survive the storms and walk.
Jesus. 